without objection. Mr. President, on May 10th, 1869, a golden spike was driven into the last link, joining the rails of the First Continental Railroad at Promontory Summit, Utah. Made of 17 karat gold and driven into a pre-drilled hole in the very last ceremonial tie, it bore the inscription, may God continue the unity of our country as this railroad unites the two great oceans of the world. And indeed, it did. With the joining of the Union Pacific Railroad stretching from the Missouri River near the Iowa-Nebraska border and the Central Pacific Railroad stretching from Sacramento, California, east met west. The United States became truly united as the spike was struck, a telegraph was sent around the nation, and bells rang out from coast to coast. This moment, you see, gave lots of people throughout the United States, and lots of people in my state of Utah in particular, access to what they needed to grow, to thrive, to prosper, to feed their families. That is, access to other people. Throughout the history of humanity, people have needed access to other people. That's why. Great civilizations have sprung up along great rivers and in areas where they had access to an ocean port. And it's one of the reasons why throughout much of history, people in landlocked regions of any country, including our own, very often had a hard time making a living. The introduction of the railroad start, started to help to change that. Now tomorrow marks the 150th anniversary of this pivotal moment. And it's only right that we pause for just a minute to recognize it. For this, Mr. President, was a moment that changed the course of history in Utah and in our nation and ultimately the entire world. With the driving of that golden spike, the arduous six-month journey that it used to require to cross the country, costing $1,000, had become a mere 10-day trip, costing over $150. Thousands of miles of tracks were laid across the country, allowing people to migrate west and to establish new settlements far more quickly, safely, and easily. And it transformed the economy across Utah and throughout the nation. Goods became efficiently transported across much further distances. Sellers found new markets, and buyers on the frontier and in rural areas were able to purchase items that had previously been completely unavailable to them, in some cases, or at least very difficult to obtain. It spurred a boom in communications, commerce, agriculture, construction, and mining. It started a significant new chapter in our relationship with Asia and the Pacific region, and it served as a model of innovation and prosperity for the rest of the world. All of this came about, it's important to note, through the perseverance and efforts of many different people from different walks of life working together. It required a clear-eyed vision from President Lincoln and the federal government and a fruitful private and public partnership that allowed the engineers, the railroad companies, and local communities the freedom to do their jobs and to do them well and without undue interference. It would not have been possible without the work of the Chinese, Irish, Mormons, Civil War veterans, Native Americans, and countless other laborers who toiled so long and so hard with such a clear devotion to build these railroads. Most of this is, of course, in the history books, as well it ought to be. Most of us have a sense of the enormous achievement that this moment represented some 150 years ago tomorrow, of the great impact that it had on our nation and the legacy that it has left behind for us and for us, our posterity. But what we often don't know are some of the stories of the ordinary men and women behind these achievements and the ones who have worked so hard to preserve this great legacy. There are, in fact, hidden heroes that make history and unseen efforts of people who work so hard to keep that history alive. The doors of history 
sometimes turn on small and often unseen hinges. And so I'd like to take a moment to honor a few of those people today who helped move history forward. Some of us might know the name of Theodore Judah, a railroad and civil engineer who was key to the original idea and design of connecting these railroads and who advocated for the so-called central route for the first transcontinental railroad, with the central route marked in red in this picture. But less familiar is the name of Theodore's wife, Anna Judah. While many routes were surveyed as possible paths for the railroad, Theodore Judah had an often scoffed that dream of laying rails through the mountains of the Sierra Nevada uh, from California going eastward. And Anna Judah shared Theodore's dream of connecting the first transcontinental railroad. When Theodore hiked and surveyed the Sierra Nevadas, Anna hiked and worked right alongside him. She sketched and did watercolors and even oil paintings of the terrain, of the plants and the foliage. She gathered and labeled, labeled the various fossils and minerals, and she took copious notes all the while, uh, taking into account different things she and her husband observed uh, as they were traveling. After their time in the Sierra Nevadas, Theodore and Anna, like Brigham Young knew, this is the place. Together they fell in love with the idea of the railroad, taking the central route across the Sierra Nevadas, believing that it would provide the perfect path for what they wanted to accomplish. So they began traveling back and forth from California, dedicating their efforts to lobbying for their dream in Washington. Anna was sharp, charming, and tenacious, and undoubtedly she was Theodore's biggest booster. She had the idea to display an exhibit right here in the Capitol, showcasing her notes and her clippings from their travels in the area, her drawings and her paintings, the samples of mineral and ore that she had collected, and charts and graphs that she was able to present in a way that made them understandable to laymen, that helped other people understand why this area was so important and the significant role that it could play in our nation's development. Literally hundreds of senators, of congressmen, lobbyists, and government clerks visited her display, which helped convince the Eastern legislators of the beauty of the Western mountains, which many of them had never seen, or at least not experienced anything uh, uh, like the way she had. And, turned their hearts to the possibility of building a railroad over them and through them to unite a country. Ultimately, Congress was persuaded, to everyone's benefit, to choose Judah's proposal for the central route, and did so in large part because of Anna Judah's efforts. Tragically, Anna's husband Theodore contracted yellow fever. As a result, he died before seeing the railroad completed. And in fact, even before the project was started in earnest. But Anna lived to see their dream to fruition. And in fact, the driving of the last spike took place on what would have been the couple's 22nd wedding anniversary. On the date of the ceremony, Anna visited her husband's grave. And she wrote that there, her husband's spirit so long dedicated to the railroad, felt somehow near to her once again. Years later, another young woman fell in love with the history of the Golden Spike and the beginning of the first transcontinental railroad. Bernice Gibbs Anderson, known to some as the mother of the Golden Spike, was born in Colorado in 1900 and lived the majority of her life in Corinne, Utah. As a little girl, Bernice helped trail cattle near Promontory Summit, and grew up hearing cowboy stories around the campfire, including stories about the Golden Spike. And as her granddaughter put it, she just plain fell in love with it. From the time she was 19, 
up until the moment of her death, she tirelessly dedicated her life to recognizing and preserving the history surrounding the Golden Spike. Bernice conceived the idea that the area around Promontory Summit ought to be set aside to commemorate the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. For years, she campaigned to make Promontory Summit a national historic monument. She visited countless legislators, governors, commissioners, and railroad officers to raise support and raise funds for a monument at Promontory Summit. A mother of six children, she also worked as a correspondent and as a staff writer for the Salt Lake Tribune, where she wrote historic articles and poetry about the Golden Spike. She sent letters and invitations to members of Congress, U.S. presidents, and Park Service officials, all in hopes that they might come to recognize the importance of the site. As president of the Golden Spike Association, she coordinated reenactment ceremonies and anniversary programs, encouraging local communities to, to participate in those celebrations every year. And while some viewed her mission as somewhat unimportant, or at least less important than other things, and, and therefore dismissed her efforts, she never gave up. Thankfully, Bernice lived to see the fruits of her labors. And after years of devoting her life to this cause, Promontory Summit was declared a national historic site on July 30th, 1965. And just this past March, it was redesignated as a national historic park, the first in Utah, allowing even more of the railroad and the surrounding area to be preserved for history going forward. Fast forward to 2019, and we've now reached the 150th anniversary of the Golden Spike. Today, another dedicated woman has been behind its sesquicentennial celebration, Spike 150, as it's known. Amy McConkie, carrying the banner, previously carried by Anna Judah and Bernice Gibbs Anderson, has been a driving force in our state and in her community. A BYU graduate, a wife and mother of four daughters, Amy has worked for 15 years in professional association management. In 2005, she founded Utah Venture Outdoors, a summer festival series in Mill Creek, Utah. For 14 years, she's volunteered her time and her resources to this event, seeking to bring the community together through recreational opportunities. In 2017, she also launched Labeled, a four-day film festival that seeks to break the stigma around mental health issues. And now she has once again brought her community together for an important cause this time to celebrate and commemorate the 150th anniversary of the placing of the Golden Spike. Under her leadership as the director of Spike 150, there are events taking place not only around Promontory Summit, but also around the entire state of Utah. Events to highlight the history and the legacy of the Golden Spike, events for children and families, and events for music, art, and train enthusiasts. It has taken tremendous amounts of organization, of coordination, and perseverance. And it would no doubt make Bernice Gibbs Anderson proud. At the 1957 celebration of the Golden Spike, she said, quote, this is sacred soil dedicated to the sacrifices of the thousands who labored in the great race to build the first transcontinental railway in the shortest possible time. The destiny of this nation rode triumphant upon the rails that met at Promontory Station. The future of this site depends on you, my friends. Will it take its rightful place in the heritage and traditions of America, or will it remain desolate and forgotten to sink into oblivion?" Close quote. Thanks to the work of people like Amy McConkie, we know that the Golden Spike will not sink into oblivion, but will indeed take its rightful place in history. Anna Judah, Bernice Gibbs Anderson, and Amy McConkie might have lived at different times, but there's a common thread that runs throughout their stories. 
the triumph of ordinary people, of the hidden heroes behind so many of our great achievements in history. Without the work of these ordinary Americans and Utahns, we never could have achieved one of the most transformative events in our nation thus far, the driving of the Golden Spike and the completion of the first transcontinental railroad. And without the work of these hidden heroes, we could never reasonably hope and expect to be able to keep this legacy alive. It's our task now to take up the banner that these women have carried, the banner of innovation, perseverance, and unity, and to ensure that our remarkable heritage lives on. If we do, there's no telling what Utah and our great nation can achieve together. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor.